back and uh, so far, you know, today we've been talking about emotional intimacy. We've had an amazing conversation. We've shared with you, uh, you know, three pillars or components of emotional intimacy that we that we've already covered. One is getting physically and psychologically healthy yourself. The second is is building upon common values, and the third is offering unconditional love conditioned upon the mutual sharing of those values. There's um, five more quickly that we want to share. Uh, the fourth one is something that is, uh, it's a concept that has been popularized recently by, by the amazing work of Dr. Brene Brown, uh, a, a researcher and a professor out of Houston, Texas. And she has probably two of the top 10 TED Talks ever given. And the very simple but yet profound and often very difficult concept that she has helped us uh, come to understand better is this idea of vulnerability as strength. Vulnerability as the key to individual health and healing and relational health. And it's, it's very different from maybe how we were all raised because um, many of us, as we've talked even today, it was about how we appear. It was about appearing happy. It was about appearing successful. It was about um, not not uh, sharing, not talking about the tough stuff, not sharing our weaknesses, but instead hiding what's uh, scary or hiding the, the things that we view as problematic, putting our best forward, compartmentalizing our lives, and then, of course, in a social structure, only talking about the things that we all agree upon, especially in a religious context. And that may be great for public relations. That may be great for... Uh, organizational health of some types of organizations, but um, you know, uh, an avoidance of vulnerability and um, an avoidance of emotional vulnerability is actually um, toxic or damaging to uh, anyone who wants to develop uh, true emotional intimacy, either with with a loved one or in a community. And so, the opposite of what we've all been doing is actually the way to. Um, to emotional intimacy, which is to talk about the difficult things, let people see inside of us, talk about the things that we've been hiding and showing that true vulnerability. And what we've been conditioned to think is that people won't love us uh, unless we are obeying and performing and are doing what they expect us to do. And uh, what, what turns out uh, that when everybody's trying to appear perfect and everybody's trying to appear like they fit a role, we're not getting closer to each other. Instead, we're just all almost robotically um, acting when we're not really getting any closer to each other. And the opposite dynamic is actually what, what um, brings people closer together. And we've seen it here this weekend. The, the minute that people start tearing up, the minute that they start sharing their weaknesses, start sharing their problems, start sharing where they're broken, we, we feel emotionally connected to those people. We uh, develop love for them. We develop affection for them. And we draw closer to them than maybe we have many people that we've been in the same ward with for 5 or 10 or 20 years. What's always astounding at these retreats is because of the vulnerability, sometimes people forge closer relationships in two and a half days than, than they do with people that they've known for years, if not an entire lifetime. And that's the power of vulnerability, and this is true in our deepest relationships. Instead of only putting our best self forward, instead of, only, um, in, instead of hiding our, our problems and our weaknesses, once we have... Um, uh, a person who shares our values and is committed to unconditional love, and we're both in a relatively healthy place, that sort of lays the soil for planting the seeds of vulnerability. And I call vulnerability the gasoline and the engine of emotional intimacy, or the seeds. And, and if we feel safe enough to plant those seeds of vulnerability, what we'll see is the emotional intimacy sprout. So this is probably the most important of all the eight steps in terms of what actually fuels the emotional intimacy. Natasha, how would you add, what Something would you add? Something just happened with oh, my computer. Oh, okay. 
So I think that one of the really important ways of how to do this is to learn the difference between vulnerability language and information. So I think a lot of times, we, you know, you might walk away from something like this and say, okay, I'm headed to vulnerability. And you go home and you sit down your mom and you're like, I've decided to leave the church. And you know, disaster ensues. <laughs> but I was being vulnerable. <laughs> right? And so that's information that um, it would be helpful in the vulnerability equation to clue your mother in to the idea that you are entering vulnerable space. And you do that not through information, but through sharing feelings. So mom, I'm really uh, feeling very nervous about sitting down with you right now. I'm a little scared. I want to talk about something that's important to me, but I'm not sure how it's going to go. Do you see the difference between kind of, you know, lubricating your information? <laughs> <laughs> When you're a sex therapist, like everything has an end you end up. But yes, lubricating your information with vulnerability language, right? So that, so because then the person isn't going to, the person is going to have a certain reaction to the information. But what, they're real, what we're really wanting vulnerability to be about is to be a reaction to you. And if you're scared, or if you're nervous, or if you're sad, or if you're angry, and you're letting me know about that, then my empathy, like John just said, we empathize with each other. We connect with one another because of our feelings, not because of really the information that we're sharing. Does that make sense? So that's a huge part of doing this successfully. Yeah. And so... So if you're dealing with a healthy person, you have something difficult to share. If you, if you start out by saying, I have something to share with you, I'm just, I want you to know I'm really scared that, that you might, I, I worry that you might not like me, you not, might not respect me, that this thing I share with you is going to come between us. Psychologically, and I don't ever want anyone to ever intentionally be manipulative, but you just have to understand the psychological reaction to that is for them to go, oh no, there's no way I'll ever reject you. There's no way that I'm ever, this is ever gonna come between us. I value uh, our relationship too much. And so starting from that vulnerable place before you share the actual vulner vulnerable information <clears throat> can, can with a healthy person really lay a, um, a groundwork for a healthy reception of whatever it is you have to share. Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to be vulnerable and talk about the powerful combination of unconditional, combination of unconditional love with vulnerability. And, uh, it's, it, it has to do with my relationship with Margie and she just left. So that, that sucks but, uh, or it's good. Uh, but you know, the, the, this is an example that some of you will relate to and some of you won't, but, um, I, and I'm going to talk about masturbation for just a second. So. I'm 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 a, a bit of a weird Mormon in the sense that I actually never masturbated before marriage. I was able, like I took I just took the church that seriously, and and my parents actually never, it was never a topic in my home. I was never told not to. It wasn't really emphasized in my my ward growing up. I'm sure other kids did it, but I just never did. So I got married, uh, having never done that, and um, Margie and I, uh, you know, got married. Then we had our first kid. And then there was that time after a childbirth where you're just not being intimate, you know, because your wife is healing. And, uh, and it, was, it was during that time where I found and myself... not having sex. What did I say? Did I say being intimate? <laughs> I come by it honestly. Thank you. We weren't having sex. Vaginal intercourse. You were not having penis and penis vagina intercourse. Vag P-I-V. <laughs> P-I-V. Wow. <laughs> the joys of co-presenting with the I sex know. therapist. Because sex is a lot more than penis and yes, vagina, yes, yes. too. Oh. So there you go. <laughs> so we were, so we, it was a period where we weren't having sex. And, um, and I just found myself in the shower one day. And I, you know, uh, and I masturbated. And from, I didn't, like, I didn't, I felt awful. Like, I felt 
And Margie, I'm telling uh, our story now, so just so you know. <laughs> I'm being vulnerable. <laughs> Margie, Margie just walked in. So you just had a baby, and I just masturbated, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Are we in sync? Are we good? Are we good? So, so, um, so I, I of course was mortified because I'm like, wait a minute, how did I go all the way to marriage, and now I'm doing this in a marriage context? So I felt super guilty and shameful about it, and of course, so of course I didn't tell her. I'm certainly not going to run down and tell my wife who just had a baby like look what I just did you know <laughs> so so I just you know I did what I did I, I hit it I, I compartmentalized it away and I'm like well I won't do that again and okay you know I, that was just a one time thing and then you know and then just whenever if we would be in a fight or if I would be on a business trip or if we you know for some reason if I was feeling like I needed that I would I would start turning to that occasionally right and, and then over time, when YouTube came out, you know, somehow I stumbled on to, you know, not naked pictures of women, but just like women kind of walking sexy or dressing sexy or kind of like being suggestive. And, and, and that, would ha that would help me obtain a release. And so I started looking at images. And, you know, long story short, 5, 10, 15 years into it, I would occasionally look at um, images and masturbate. Uh, you know, once a couple weeks, once every three weeks, once a month, whatever it was. But the more important point is, I just carried this incredible shame about it every year, and we never talked about it. And and the weird thing is, the more shameful I felt about it, and I was going to church during this whole time, the more shameful I felt about it, the more I would try and not do it, but then the more I tried not to do it, the more I would do it. So I was caught in the shame spiral of the worse I felt about it, the more I try not to do it, and the more I do it. And then I, it, it got to the point where it was, where weirdly it was like I was almost doing it more than I really wanted to, and I, I was just caught in this awful um, spiral, you know, of my own kind of like of my own doing to myself, or in the context of the church. So anyway, we get to this kind of midlife point where where we're doing Mormon stories and we're living in Logan and you know Margie had been begging me for emotional intimacy for many many years and I didn't even understand what she was asking for I'm like what we watch we watch Felicity together like what else do, <laughs> like what else do you need from me like we we exercise together we talk about the kids we watch TV shows what do you need what are you what are you asking for you know I I just didn't even speak the language of emotional intimacy. I didn't even, like, like we've talked about, I was illiterate. So, um, so once, once our marriage really started to fray, um, and I was starting to ask myself, after I had lost my faith, and after I was starting to question morality, and I reached that phase where I was really angry about all, you know, a lot of my friends had left their spouses or were divorced and they would share with me kind of their sexual exploits and their, you know, their sexual adventures as single men. And I was like, Oh, that's when I, you know, like I joked about this the other day is like, what all the sex I could have had and all the things that ways I could have experimented. And I started feeling angry at the church and resentful for what I might've missed out on all the fun that I could have had. And our, you know, our marriage, was struggling in some ways because we had not learned any of these principles. And I got to the point where not only was I questioning, you know, I didn't, I didn't believe in the church anymore. And then I was questioning the existence of God, which meant I was wondering how, what my morality really was. I was getting to the point where I was questioning whether I wanted to stay married to Margie. And, um, I was leaning against it. I was just like, I think, well, I'll be happier. Like we're fighting a lot. Our kids are struggling Midlife, th this is awful. Maybe the answer is for us not to be married anymore, you know? And so, but, but you can't just say that. You can't just say, I don't want to be married to you anymore, because that's awful, right? You don't just say to somebody, I don't want to be with you anymore. Um, so we, we do some catastrophic thing to blow it up instead of actually confronting it directly. So, um, so I started to go down that road of, of, 
of starting to act in a self-destructive way and in a marriage destructing way. But oddly enough, um, what I decided to do, my little genius plan was, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell Margie that I sometimes masturbate and look at porn. And I know she's going to be devastated. And, and I know that it's going to make her angry at me and furious. And if she's angry and furious at me, then I'm not going to stand for that. And that will be the way that we can part. You know, so it was like I'll sabotage by being, you know, my, my strategy was I'm going to be candid and honest as a way to sabotage this relationship that I maybe I want out of. You know what I'm saying? And um, I don't know that it was that calculated, but as I look back, that's kind of how I think about what I was doing. So I, I, did, th I did that. I, I sat her down one day and I just, this is how I remember it. Marg, you may remember it differently. You can, you can respond to this uh, dialogue if you want, uh, this monologue. But I sat her down and I told her, I said, Margie, sometimes I, I masturbate and I look at porn. And just like, you know, the way I remember it is immediately the tears just start streaming down her cheeks. And I see the devastation, or at least I perceive devastation in her face. And I'm thinking, yes, you know, I mean, I'm not really thinking that way because I'm breaking her heart. But at the same time, I'm like, this marriage isn't going great. And I'm looking for a way out. And this is all kind of going like I thought I would. You know what I mean? And... And, you know, and that's kind of what we think is that if, if, if we don't do what's right, if we don't follow the rules, you know, the love is conditional. But what I, what I experienced was not that. Of course, Margie was hurt about that, to hear that and to hear that I'd been doing that for so many years and that we hadn't talked about it. And of course, she had been conditioned to think about that as meaning maybe that I didn't find her attractive or maybe I wasn't maybe I was being unfaithful because some people associate pornography and masturbation with faithfulness or you know insecurities that she may have had or you know whatever was going through her mind that made her cry um, there were good reasons for that but after she kind of gained her composure and this may have not been the exact same day what the way she responded was was really took me by surprise because she was like it wasn't a shameful response she didn't shame me i didn't feel like she thought i was a bad person she she kind of got curious about it and she was like well you know the, you know i love you and the only thing i just want to say is you know, is there anything we can do in our, you know, sexual intimacy, emotional, is there anything I can do so that I can meet your needs in, in any other way that we can, you know, whether it's frequency or different ways we can try different things. Like, I just want you to know, I'm always, I'm, I always want you to feel like I'm interested in, in sex when you're feeling like you want that. So it wasn't like, don't do that anymore and you're awful. It was just, hey, what can we do to enhance our relationship so that you just know that I'm, I'm, I always want to be there for you? And again, I'm not saying that a woman should feel like it's her job to service her husband. I'm not saying that. I'm, but I am telling you what her reaction was to me. And it, it, it sounds, there's two things that, that are profound about it, at least to me. One was how for the first time I started feeling this unconditional love. I was just like, whoa, she didn't want, she didn't want to kick me out. She didn't shame me. She still loves me. And that was just like, I, I wouldn't have guessed that. I would have guessed this kind of would have been Armageddon to our marriage, but it wasn't. Um, but this, the second crazy mind bending thing, guess what it did to my desire to masturbate and look at porn? It decreased significantly where I was caught in that trap of trying to stop, but then doing it more just to be told, Hey, I love you. And Hey, it's, it's no big deal. And, um, you know, if there's anything we can do to enhance our intimacy, I'm here. That transformed, that took it from something that was like 
freaking me out and was a problem and was always on my mind to like, I kind of lost interest. And I'm not going to say I never did it again or I've never done it or, you know, I'm, but my point is it fundamentally changed that whole trap that I was caught in. The combination of vulnerability, you know, unconditional love and vulnerability. And it led to, oddly, some of the first cracking opens in our relationship where we were able to be vulnerable about other vulnerable about other things where we felt safe about other things and it became one of the important inflection points for us healing um, a lot of problems in our marriage and and climbing in terms of our marital satisfaction and connection and so that that's just I just want to share that in a sense of vulnerability to help illustrate the concepts of unconditional love and vulnerability. Now, Margie, do you want do you want to add anything to that? Did I get anything wrong, or do you want to give your perspective? Um, one thing that I would say is that conversation um, I think happened at a time of our in our marriage that you mentioned, where there was a deep tumult going on, and I think um, the way I remember and memory is very faulty, as we know. But the way I remember it is, I sensed something going on in our relationship, but couldn't, I didn't know what it was. And when we sat down that day, uh, John provided a list. It was like not just porn and masturbation. It was like, this isn't working for me, I hate it when you do this, this isn't. And it was like a list of like seven to 10 things and what I realized was, and the, the crying was just this sense of like, oh, my reality actually is not my reality, right? I've been living, and I think it's important to know our marriage wasn't bad. Like, if I looked around, we spent more time together than other marriages. But that's the way this stuff works, is I think, you know, it, you can oftentimes be blindsided yourself by things that you feel. But I had this sense of like this rush of sharing a lot. Right, And then I remember my response from there being, well, what is it that you need? And then from there, we revisited a lot of the things that he talked about. And that was a shift in our marriage where I decided for, you know, and what do you need to heal? And what do you need? And kind of negotiating that in a way where we could really heal and rebirth uh, the relationship and part of that was porn and masturbation and I actually remember at one point I said you know if I just want you to know that if there's a shame component where you feel like you have to do it alone that I'm willing to do it with you like I, I can be intimate with you while you do those things if so if if there's this shame thing about you going off and feeling like or and so I just think I don't know there are those moments and vulnerability sometimes doesn't feel soft you know it can feel lousy it can feel actually in the moment like one of the worst things ever but there was a rebirth and a new start uh, I think to our relationship in that moment thank you and of course there were all sorts of ways that I was not meeting Margie's needs and that that obviously is something that we arrived at as well, that it wasn't just about my needs, it was about her needs and our needs. And so thank you for indulging me as I share that. I hope that is helpful in some way to uh, illustrate some of these points. I don't know that I would add more to this other than, you know, I think this is one of those classic principles <clears throat> where the golden rule really does apply. You know, it's, it's really easy to want this and it's really hard to offer it. And so I think, you know, that's a, that's a thing I try to constantly be thinking about with my own kids or my spouse or my friends is, am I a, a, a safe enough, you know, vehicle to be approached with vulnerability? It's not just about, oh, I've got to take the risk and be vulnerable with people and see if they're gonna be safe. It's like, am I also safe for that in return, and um, and that's a really hard thing to look in the mirror at sometimes, right? Because of my own reactions, my own triggers, my own things that I get angry about, or I'm disappointed in, or um, really frustrated with. So it's it's a two way 
straight all the time. It's hard. <laughs> Emily wants to clap. <laughs> Emily wants to clap. Anyone else want to clap? Go ahead and clap, Emily. Emily's clapping. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. So my, so I know being vulnerable is important and everything, but coming from a place like, um, trying to just get my thoughts in order, like it, being vulnerable in my family growing up, like a lot of people would have thought we had a, this great family, and we do it in a lot of aspects my, for my parents, but it was definitely was not a safe place to be vulnerable. Like I feel like a lot of manipulation type of thing happens. And I know like just inherently like, as I've gotten older, I've started recognizing, especially just recently as I've been exploring the thought and idea of vulnerability and as a good thing. Um, I just don't know, how do you even take steps? Because to be vulnerable, like, because, you know, for 40 years, I've, I think that I've lived my entire life being very not vulnerable and like the Mormon fake um, is very strong <laughs> within me. <laughs> But the force. I, I don't know <laughs> what I'm saying exactly, but it's just neither my mom nor my dad were very safe to be vulnerable with. And um, we were, it was okay. Some, even though it was not spoken, I knew how I was supposed to react and act to things. And I've always kind of pushed against it and like hated that. But in a sense, I, I know that I have brought that into my own marriage. And so it's just one of those things that I'm like, I, I totally agree with you and I love it. But I don't even know, how do you even do that? Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's mm -hmm. all. Oh, that's a really good, yeah. Mm -hmm. A few thoughts as you were talking. I mean, I think that back to the spectrum thing, finding who are the safest people in your life, you know, to start practicing that with so that you can build upon positives. Um, another thing that's really something that comes up in therapy a lot with a lot of people, uh, especially going back and trying to do repair attempts with parents or abusers or you know people that you feel like really harmed you. Um, and some people really want that chance to go back and be able to confront something. A big part of the, the work that we do in individual therapy in those kinds of cases is to make sure that that, that process, that risk that you're taking is much more centered on your on your ability to do that and not focused on the result you're gonna get. Because you can't guarantee the result. Some of these efforts go really well, like surprisingly well. You know, some people have been dealing with 10 years of secrecy, kind of like this, right? Where he thought, oh my gosh, the minute I say that, our marriage is over. And yet he sits down with his wife and has a very different experience than he expected. And other times, you know, you're thinking, oh my goodness, I'm gonna take a risk, I think it'll probably go okay, and then you're devastated. You know, like, my father said he wouldn't even believe me if I was sexually assaulted, right? So, you really, one of the tricks, maybe, is to visualize yourself offering vulnerability and have that be the space where it's successful, and not allow the response to necessarily be such a measurement stick because you don't have any control over the response. And then you can also visualize yourself with a positive response or a negative or neutral response. How would I then, you know, it's kind of like playing chess, right? You think ahead <laughs> a few steps, right? And so it's kind of like, well, if, if this were to happen, what could I then say? Or if this was to happen, how can I kind of shut down the conversation and go self-soothe in some way? Or, is there a support person I could go then talk to? Or, you know, so have, have kind of some strategies in place to help you not be so dependent on the response. Margaret wanted to say one thing. And then Jim. Margaret, go ahead. Did you go over levels of relationship yeah. already? Okay, so one thing, maybe you mentioned this, did you talk about it with regard to vulnerability? What I'll say is this. Um, in a recent interview I was listening to with Brene Brown, um, she was talking about, wow, like I brought up this concept of vulnerability, and now everyone is just being vulnerable all over the place, <laughs> right? And this is just not what I intended. So what I meant was basically definitely go for vulnerability, but the 
people we're vulnerable with should, should be worthy of it. And that's a really important piece because I find, particularly with coaching, you'll have people, um, particularly family, right? Family's a really tricky area with regard to this where we're talking about a mother or a sister. So we have this idea it's a close relationship. But if you apply the level of relationship, let's do the one five, one being more surface, five being deep. It's really a level two, but we're going in at a five. And it's really important, I think, just to kind of check that. If it, if it really is a level two, let's try. It, it's healthy to go in at a level two, right? So we're keeping the level five, and that kind of goes back to your question in my mind, is it's easier to be vulnerable with the people who have already done right by our vulnerability. That gives us this sense of success, right, and being cared for and having it really received in the way that we so deserve. So level of relationship is a great thing to consider when it comes to sharing vulnerability and who we share it with. Jacob. Thanks. So I think that, Margie, you actually addressed what I was going to ask about, and, and that is um, that I wonder if we could speak to the level of healing that comes from just the act of trying to be vulnerable, even though the response could be really negative, maybe in some ways. Because uh, I know that Emily and I, if we've worked to be vulnerable in our relationships and with family members as well, have had that discussion about you know what kind of an outcome do we expect to get from this sort of thing. So I, I guess if I try and dial that more in, is how do you make the differentiation between it's better that I just not even make this attempt if it's going to be negative or I'm going to make the attempt. It's probably going to be negative and I hope that it helps me or maybe it helps me more to not do it. I don't know if that's clear or not. So. Well, there's no right or wrong necessarily in this process and some of it we find out through practice, right? So if I do something once or twice and it really doesn't give me the results I'd hoped for, that's information I can now do different things with. Um, and some people may decide not to take the risk at all. And then that, you know, if you can, again, kind of frame that from the perspective of where's that, where's that decision coming from as far as my risk cost benefit analysis per se. Um, I, I guess, uh, what I would say is that this is the power of framing it. So, you know, so much of the work that we do is cognitive behavioral work. And that's really choosing a different story or a different way to think about it. So if you're going into a vulnerability risk or exercise with the idea of I'm going to feel proud about myself that I even took this risk and I'm, I'm kind of working against my own proclivities that I'm trying to better myself and then the, the, the success isn't even related to what happens, right? Then the success is like, wow, I stepped out of my comfort zone. I did something different. I tried something new. Um, the results of that really doesn't have anything to do with your primary success then at that point. So I think framings are really an important way to, to think about this. Would you be comfortable telling us a little bit more about the relationship you have in mind when you ask that question? That will help us answer your question a little more. Is there a person, and you don't have to give names, you, you don't have to necessarily identify the person in a way that you think would not be safe, but whatever you can tell us about the issue and or the person that still is safe helps us uh, with, a, with a formulated response. Okay. Um, so, and, you know, push me over or reach up, push the, turn the mic off or something. I, I, um, Emily and I have spent a lot of time in our marriage talking about her relationship with her mom. And, her mom. yeah. And, and uh, I know that there's a lot of pain there. And we're not really sure the best way to address that. And my fear comes from, I don't want it to get worse for Emily. So that's, um, I think we know that there needs to be some sort of communication there or some sort of uh, um, uh, just acceptance of how it actually is. Um, but how to get to that point in a way where it's a, a healthy and a good thing, 
I, we don't really know how to make that journey. And so my question really was designed, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about, is it, is this something that we need to just divorce ourselves from and just accept it? Or is there a way through this? Because I'm very uh, uncomfortable with how the outcome could affect us. Yeah, beautiful. And this is really, uh, we have a couple of people already wanting to respond. Let me give my quick response and then Becca and then Fred. Um, so th there are a couple values that are I'm hearing coming into play. One is the value of authenticity with, with Emily's mom, potentially, right? There's another value of safety. How safe is it to be authentic? And in this case, there's your safety. But then there's also her mom's safety because... Sometimes it can be devastating to a parent to hear that their kid no longer believes or is struggling with something. And another value that I often like to introduce here is the value of compassion. And the extreme example I give is a 90-year-old 90, 90 grandma who's on her deathbed. Do you go and tell her that you hate the church and you've left it? And when she's not asking it and her days are numbered, and it's just going to sort of like sour the, the final moments of her life, right? That's an extreme example, but there is an element of compassion you can overlay here to say, you know what, I do value authenticity, but the, 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 I value compassion too, and the compassion in this case overrides any need I have to be authentic because why spoil this person's final days on the earth? You know what I mean? So... Those are all things that, like when Tatasha said, there's no right answer. How much do you focus on authenticity versus your own safety versus her safety versus compassion? But, but it's important to, to keep those dynamics in mind. And you brought in the final value of acceptance, which is a really important psychological move. Because it, is, it would be totally reasonable just to say, I think that, I think that our relationship... I value this relationship, even if it's superficial on some level, but it would probably be catastrophic to our relationship for me to be vulnerable or catastrophic to them or catastrophic to us. And so I will intentionally make the choice to never go there, to never talk about Mormonism with these people because like Natasha said, the, the math doesn't add up to it being worth it. And then there's another there's another component to that, which is the level of disclosure. It's one thing to say the church is a total fraud and I hate it and I'm never going back. It's another thing just to say, hey, our relationship, and we talk about this in the gift of the Mormon faith crisis. We'll talk about this in our presentation about communicating with believing family and friends. But there is a move that just says, hey, love sandwich, love you. You've been a great parent. Um, I'm so grateful for our upbringing. I love the church in so many ways our relationship with the church has kind of changed a little bit. And I just, I won't go, I won't go into any more detail than that, but I love you. And then the other part of the sandwich, I love you. We're the same people. We're committed to parenting and, and our, our marriage and we love you and all the good things about the church, you know, but, but our relationship with the church has changed and then never going beyond that. Cause you really do communicate all that needs to be communicated, which is things have changed. Um, but then you don't go into the detail that could be more devastating. So those are all, we're not going to be able to give you the formula or the answer, but, but balancing some of those values can be important factors for whatever you end up deciding. Did your relationship with your mom change significantly with the faith transition, or was it always a difficulty? Or does she know? They know. Um, it, honestly, it didn't... I feel bad because I, I, I would rather, I mean, this is so central to just one person. It's a weird relationship. It, it didn't change who's, much. Who's honestly. here to think about their relationship with their parents? <laughs> okay, so is, this, is this okay. helpful to everybody? Okay. Okay, well, I'm, no, my main thing is just, no, my relationship with my mom and my parents has been strained for years and years, my whole life, probably. Um, I used to be kind of, it's like the opposite. I was super close to her throughout my teen years, super open. And, but it was because I was always doing exactly what she wanted, pleasing her. I was a pleaser. And once I became an adult, I decided that's when things started changing is, you know, I went on my mission and she loved that. And it all kind of started when I got married. 
But um, anyways, so the last few years have been really bad, but it's more just, it's when I started not conforming to what was expected of me, even though from the outside I look like I've done everything right. Anyways, I don't know. So we actually have told her that we've left, but it's just been 100% radio silence. Like, I talked to my sister, and who, and she guilted my mom into talking to me. Anyways, it's fine, but it's more just my whole thing about vulnerability is I, I've kind of come to the point of, that's okay, that relationship with my mom is just, you know, she's in her mid-70s, it's not, I don't know, I've just kind of, it is what it is, but it's more that I feel like to be vulnerable with my husband, which I've always felt like there's, I wanted to be more open, more intimate, on an intimate level of, with my, and I kind of feel like maybe that's, it's because I've kind of shut all intimacy off with, my dad's been shut off for my entire life, and I feel like once I became an adult, it kind of got shut off with my mom too, and so I just kind of feel like it's transferred. But anyways, this is probably not something for a huge group discussion. <laughs> I don't know. I, yeah. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like that. That's all I was saying. That's why I was asking about. Like, well, how do you take those steps to to be vulnerable? Because I haven't. I don't feel like I've been vulnerable in my entire life. I've right. always been very sheltered. Always put on a pretty hard core front um, with everybody in my life, no matter who they are. Right. So. So we have know. Becca, Fred, and Karen. I want to recommend a book called Getting the Love You Want by Harville Hendricks. Um, these are three really powerful books that help Margie and I through a lot. And Harville Hendricks, um, his kind of shtick is we all come to our relationships with brokenness, with dysfunctional relationship patterns or trauma, right? And sometimes we even pick our partners either as a way to sort of help save us from past trauma or as sort of a way to, in some dysfunctional way, repeat the trauma until we kind of learn whatever lesson we need to learn. But there's something powerful about whatever trauma we bring to the marriage, why we choose our partner as it relates to our past traumas, but then also um, the, you know, the opportunity of all of that is oh and then and then when we get angry and triggered and lose our minds in our marriage it's usually because our partner has stepped on that triggered slash traumatic sort of place that's deeply rooted in our childhood and usually in our relationships with our parents right and so what this book does is it it's a systematic approach and if you can believe this margie and i were still attending the church you know in 2012 2013 when we when we decided we really needed to fix our marriage. So, but we hated Sunday school, So, but we wanted our kids to go to church. So we would go to soccer meeting and then drop our kids off at Sunday school. And then we'd go walk home and we would do the exercises out of this book as our Sunday school, right? And then we'd go back to, you know, if we felt like it, we'd go back to Priest and Relief Society. This is back when church was still three hours, when the real Mormons were doing the Mormon thing. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> But, uh, but what this book does is it, it, it's got a, like a, a week-by-week approach where you identify your triggers and traumas and vulnerabilities. You th- be thoughtful about why you chose the partner you did as, relations- as, as related to these traumas. You then practice talking about these sacred places, talking about why we get triggered, talking about why we're triggering the other and then practice the vulnerability that leads to the healing. And so I just want to recommend that book as a really great resource for you and your husband to be able to practice identifying and healing from the types of things that you're responding. I don't mean to just push it off on a book. Margie, would you agree that 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 could be useful? Okay. About 15 years ago, um, my... Anyway, my siblings and I found out about our dad having this, like, double life. Um, The whole time he was in high council and bishopric and expecting a lot from us of, um, you know, expectations of, you know, you're going to get married in the temple, you're going to do this, you're going to go on missions. We were, like, the perfect family at church and um, 
<laughs> so if anybody's watching this today, they'll be like, what? They're... And so <laughs> I'm a little freaked out because my parents are both very much alive. But um, so I hope they never find it. But if they do, it's okay. It's <laughs> I'll still live um, or I'll move away. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, so <laughs> my so anyway, my siblings and I we kind of dealt with our, our own ways. Some of us went really off the deep end and. I kind of pulled more to the church because that was all I knew and that's what I held on to and the rest of them kind of, we all kind of just waffled in space for a while trying to figure things out. And now we're all, that's one thing that really brought us close together is we realized we had our parents' mess in common that impacted our lives considerably. And so about two years ago in therapy, the therapist I was with said, um, I don't know, there's this drug called ketamine and they give you a shot and they put you under and he wanted to do a group ketamine session with my siblings. He thought that would be really impactful because I don't you you kind of go into this anyway hypnotic state and um, and in that space it was it was actually really healing because um, we realized how much we were what we were doing for each other in this because you feel like you're in a different existence there, but in this existence, how much our roles in the family we were playing were looking out for each other and really being concerned for each other. And they, he, the therapist told us that 24 hours after that, ketamine would be really effective, that our minds would be clear and crisp, and we felt it. It was, it was actually really crazy, but we felt, I felt, I'm always like wishy-washy. I don't know, I don't know, should I do that? And I was like, I need to do this, this, this. So in that moment, we decided randomly just to drive to my parents' house and go sit down with them and have a discussion because my mom had played us all against each other she would say one thing to another and one thing to another and we as we as we talked we all realized we are being pawns in their little scheme of and it was just it was so unfair to us and so we decided if we were all there we would be a strength to each other so we sat down in the room and and we didn't do it as beautifully as Natasha just did. <laughs> we kind of, but it, we were very direct, which I have always struggled with. I'm a little passive. And I just said, I will no longer be the peace, the, not the peacemaker, but the, pa- the pleaser. I said, I have always worked so hard to please both of you and I'm done with it. I'm not doing it anymore. And we said, mom, you are doing this, this, and this. Dad, we have found out terrible things about you and we love you no matter what. All we're asking for is that you love us as we are, just like we're trying to love you for who you are. And mom, you're, if you want to have a relationship with us, this has to stop. And you can no longer do this. Like we kind of just set up boundaries and we walked out of that together feeling like it was the most amazing, like we go back to that all the time now and we're like, that ketamine was the bomb. <laughs> that was the moment we like took back our lives for each other but you know our marriages are struggling every single one of us um we were vulnerable in that moment with our parents but we don't know how to do it in our relationships so and now that therapist no longer practices because i don't know what happened maybe we set him over the edge but um i hope not but anyway um my whole point was what i found interesting with that whole experience is that my mom and dad could have turned to each other and turned to us and you would think i i thought it was the most loving approach like we were very loving i mean the things he has done are pretty i i think pretty disgusting but we love him because he's our dad and we wanted him to know that and so what i found interesting was that in that moment where they could have just loved us we realized they're not capable of that and so Even here, it's been a year later, and I finally called my dad, like it was about a year, a full year before they wouldn't even talk to us. And I was in a conversation with them, and he just said, that was, it was our fault. It was, look, how dare us talk to them that way? How dare we do this to them? And I realized, you know what, I can still love my parents, and I'm so proud of myself and my siblings that we were vulnerable in that moment, but I don't need them I don't need them to to tell me anything I I know that I know I'm lovable I know what I did was brave 
and um, going forward, I have to keep them at a distance in my life because I realize they're not capable of giving me what I had hoped for. And that doesn't make them bad people, but that makes them incapable of being the people I need in my life right now that I need because they're very toxic and I can't, I can't have that. But I, but I will always respect and love them for what they've done for me and for the life they've given me. And I will um, be their daughter who still goes up and helps them move furniture or help them with whatever they may need in their life. But it's not the loving, caring relationship I had hoped. It's not the mom I wanted. It's not the dad I need. But it's mourning the loss of that, but it's okay. So. The things I wanted to share have been covered 10 times over. Just nothing right now but gratitude for everything that's been shared. Karen, did you still? So I was just thinking, first of all, this group of people is so amazing. Your comma was so beautiful. But um, so my little brother, when he came out of the closet, um, my parents handled it so badly that when he came out, when he came out of the closet just to them and to me, we were the only three, three that knew and his mission president. Um, my parents handled it so badly that when he came out to the rest of the world, nobody knew. Um, my parents refused to even admit that he had told them uh, that they had known all those years ago. Um, and they had, were really horrible to him. They did a really poor job. But in like a moment of vulnerability, when my child, many years later, um, told me that she was, um, she was my daughter instead of my son, I kind of went to my parents knowing my child is going to be coming out to the world and they have to know before the rest of the world knows. And I cried and I said, I'm about to tell you the hardest thing and maybe it will kill you because my dad was 90, he's almost 91 now. My mom was 86 and now she's almost 87. And um, they shocked and amazed me by being nothing but loving and supporting of my child. And I look back at that and I know that my little brother paid the price for my daughter now because my parents couldn't accept something all those years ago that now because my brother paid the price for it, my parents now could be loving to my child. So this really horrible thing that you're going through with your mom, other people in your family are going to follow after you and other people are going to come and maybe your parents will grow up and will expand and your mom will become a different person through your love and through just you being you. So maybe she can show up maybe sometime in the future for someone else in a way that she couldn't for you. And this other thing, you can be everything to yourself that your mom wasn't to you and you can be everything to your own children that she wasn't capable of being because you now know exactly what you need to do differently. And you are so warm and beautiful, and you totally have this. <laughs> that is one thing that I think for me really stands out. I love the idea of providing really intentional opportunities for people in our lives to have the information and to have um, the vulnerability attempt. I do always like to say, if you have a highly, like a history of highly problematic behavior, though, there is such a thing as letting it go. And in providing yourself, um, you know, that warmth and that healing, because you can see it so often, the children of parents really taking on the healing. They want all the healing and the parents are not growth mindset, either at that moment or for decades or for, and it, is, it can be tremendously um, traumatizing to keep at this thing that you can't fix. You can't own both sides. You can only own your side. And so I just wanna be really um, direct about that, that there are times when you've gotta drop that rope too, and you've gotta release it. And the best you can do is really, like I was saying before, kind of go back to yourself and say, 
can I mother myself? How can I be that mother I so am worthy of? And sometimes, you know, friends can be that. I have amazing friends as well that give me such nurturing love. We get to be that for each other. And then it is that, just like you were saying, with our own children, sometimes that's the healing we get, is that you get to really step into empowerment and say, it stops here. It stops here. I'm doing something different. And so that wound I have, I can't go to my, I can't heal that through this relationship, but I will, will heal it through my daughter. And I will definitely offer the love that I so was deserving of to my son, you know? There's two thoughts I'm having right now. One that Margie just brought up, which is so important in intergenerational work, and we do this in genograms. Genograms is how we kind of assess a family system. We look for pattern breakers, pattern breakers. And to be a pattern breaker in your family system is a tremendous thing. And in many ways, you're all doing that just by being here today, right? So there's something very beautiful about being able to understand the, the limits of your system and offer something new to the generations in front, right? We have language for that in Mormonism, but it's very, it's very um, incorrectly placed, right? That, oh, you're going to ruin generations to come if you leave the church. But um, emotional intimacy is, is a space where you can have a lot of power in generations to come. The second thought I had as we're doing all this is how, how many times did the CES letter come up or church at all, right? Like these are all issues that are, that are affected by church membership and church ideas. Uh, and we could have made, I could have said something like, yeah, ever since I sent you that letter, Mom, about our church stuff, I've, I've even noticed it get worse. You know, I could have said something like that in our little dialogue. But very little about this is about church doctrine, really. When you really get down to sharing, I miss you, I love you, I want more closeness with you. Maybe we do put some, things, some topics on the shelf that are hard for us to know how to navigate. So how do we focus on all these other things that we have in common, right? And so... Very little of this has to do about learning how to talk to your family and friends about doctrine. Okay. All right. So, vulnerability. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Two good thing. Two hours later. Go get it. Go do it. Go for it. It's good. We need it. Um, all right. Uh, there's only seven, not eight. I've been saying eight all along, but there's only seven today. Um, I don't know how one got lost, but uh, five. Component five that we're offering today as a tool for emotional intimacy is develop a meaningful friendship by spending quality time together regularly. This is something John Gottman uh, really emphasizes in his book. Uh, again, I'll reference that book. It's called The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. Natasha has an entire amazing presentation on marriage that's that's built at least in part on the work of John Gottman. Uh, there's a really great, if you guys watch or listen to the Dax Shepard podcast called Armchair Expert, uh, Margie lovingly asked me to listen to this episode with Dax Shepard and John Gottman. So to and from this retreat, I've been listening to John Gottman and uh, it's really good stuff. But he emphasizes that couples who do really well, well together spend quality time together and as, I would recommend, fr as friends. I would recommend that book just flat out, relationship-wise. I don't think it's just, I think the principles relate to parenting. And even if you're single, you're going to have relationships. I would get honed in on those Oh, skills. not just for marriage. just for, yeah, yeah, even though it yeah. says seven principles for making marriage work, I think it's a great book for just relationships Human in relationships, general. Yeah. Yes. And it talks about contempt and it talks about stonewalling and it talks about criticism and yeah. what he calls the four horsemen of the apocalypse uh, of relationships. <laughs> and uh, But, but the, you know, we don't have to dwell a, a lot of time here other than to say, um, it, you know, it's really hard to develop emotional intimacy with somebody unless you're, you're also just spending meaningful time together. I, I remember when Margie and I were even when, during our separation, I told them about our separation. Um, <laughs> during our separation, 
we sought a coach, uh, Liz Dalton. We love her. And she gave us this rule, which was, okay, while you're courting again, trying to decide if you want to stay married, um, you're to go on a date once a week with each other. And I forbid you to talk about anything that would ever cause you to have conflict during that date. Your date is purely for fun and enjoyment. And no talking about anything serious. You are forbidden from having any conflict during that date. And all you're allowed to do is like go to a movie or go on a walk or have fun or go out to eat, whatever it is, you know, but you're forbidden from any conflict and you're only allowed to have fun. And it was weird. It's like, whoa, we have to be told don't have conflict and we have to be like put, shamed into just enjoying ourselves. But, um, you know, that, that that's kind of stuck with me. And so I, I was working with a client just the other day and, and his wife, uh, a couple, and they were really struggling over mixed faith marriage stuff. And they realized that before he had had his faith crisis, they had had a weekly date together, a date night. And they, it didn't even occur to them nine months later, after the faith crisis and all the trauma that ensued, that they had stopped having those date nights. And uh, th those sorts of things where you just find a way to get away, take a little weekend, take a night away. Margie and I, we thought we had to go to Mexico to have a great getaway. We just, we, we drive 10 minutes to the Grand America and just spend a night at a local hotel where we're away from the home, away from the context of work and kids, and we'll sit in the jacuzzi, we'll sit it by the pool, we'll go to a local restaurant, but just getting away, even if it's a staycation, we do that a few times a year, and it's a really lovely memory uh, that, that we share. And so, if you want to develop a good emotional intimacy with somebody, have fun with them, have joy with them, develop regular meaningful investments of time. Uh, because it's, it's, it's more than just serious uh, relationships and vulnerability and all the heavy and sadness that comes with being vulnerable and receiving that. It's just also learning how to enjoy each other. And time is a limited commodity, so please don't feel like you're supposed to be at a five with everybody. You know, you can't really do that. Choose wisely who your fives and fours are going to be. And then that way your twos and threes and ones feel less painful too. It's like, okay, so yeah, I have the, the weather type of relationship with this particular <laughs> family member. You know, how's the weather? And we're polite and we see each other once a year at the family reunion, right? And even though there's maybe sadness in that and you wish it was different, it's okay. Not every relationship has to be at a five. Turning this to the conversation about children, because I know many of you are thoughtful, mindful about your relationships as parents with your children. I've tried to do this with my own children. And so, you know, I have a child that likes to play video games. And, and I played video games growing up, but I felt like, well, your video game playing is excessive and it's not good for you, even though mine, you know, was, was heavy at the time. But <laughs> the, the point is that we got into this adversarial relationship where... I was just always getting angry at the video game playing and he was, you know, just getting more and more annoyed with me at how controlling and, and, and judgmental I was. And it was just wrecking our relationship. And so I just did a couple things differently. I, I realized that he really was interested in snowboarding. I had not learned. So we started snowboarding together and, and it was completely ineffective to try and like ask him at breakfast how he's feeling in the morning. Cause he didn't want, you know, sometimes kids don't want to talk or, or after school, like tell me about your school day. Like sometimes the last thing a kid ever wants to do after they've come home from school is talk about their day. And so even those attempts at connecting when explicit were, were backfiring and making things worse. But when we found ways to either snowboard together or I actually started playing video games again, and I'm like, what video game do you play? I'll learn it, and we'll play together. Those provided moments for us to then have a little more fun, a little more casual conversations, and it's helped in our emotional intimacy as a parent-child. So whether it's date nights with your kids, hobbies that you pursue with your kids, um, or loved ones, this applies to kids' parent-child relationships as well. underline because 
you know, we go on dates and we just go to dinner and a movie and it's not like quality. We don't have deep conversations. And then as you go on, I'm like, wait, the word quality to me is has a different meaning for me. It's like, oh, we have to be having deep conversations. We have to be vulnerable. We have to do like that quality time is is like has to be quantified by like how deep and how emotional we get. But now I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> We're supposed to be having good times, and the quality of the time is is how much joy it brings us, not how much sadness and trauma <laughs> is dealt with, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I, <laughs> my comment went, but changed quite quickly, <laughs> but that was just something that I noticed that I think sometimes like our definition of things need to change in order for growth and 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 things to change to happen. Yes. Other comments about this, uh, this point? I just want to quickly say that when, after I left the church and Jacob was still in, that we decided to have dates where we did not talk about anything church-related because it was so painful. And even though I so wanted to talk about it, I mean, I wanted his thoughts, I wanted his feelings, and um, we weren't really talking about it any other time, and so it seemed like a great avenue, and so we just sort of made a rule, like, we hardly see each other, when we go on dates, we are laughing, and we are having fun, because that is, that was at that time, the only time I think we remembered each other. Mm. And so I, I, don't, I think that's not just a um, thing you can do with your spouse when you're going through a difficult time with, in any relationship, um, that you need to you know, have a time where there's still that person you loved. Yeah. All right, number six evolve into a fierce commitment to the other's well-being. And this is this is something as I watched couples go from orthodox couples to mixed faith couples to you know high conflict couples to eventually really really healthy couples. There's this point in the marriage for whatever whatever reason where each person is defending their own side, their own turf. It's like well you work too much and you don't spend time with me and then it's like well I I'm earning a living and I need to work because you spend all my money. And, and so there's this like, there's turf, right? And you're defending it. You're defending your turf. Well, I believe and you broke the contract. And it's like, well, I'm just seeking truth and you're blind and you have your head in the sand. And just this idea of each of you defending yourself and kind of attacking the other. And what I've seen as transformational that many couples uh, uh, don't see as a possibility, but it's some of the most inspiring work I've ever done, especially with mixed faith couples, is when the couple is able to work through everything we've talked about to get to the point where instead of the believer defending the believing turf and the non-believer defending the non-believing turf, each one is defending the turf of the other. In other words, let's say there's a mixed faith couple and one of the kids starts trashing on people who aren't faithful in the church. It's, it's an extra order, order of power if it's the believing partner that says to that child, hey, there are, there, there are people who don't believe for really good reasons. There are people who stop believing because of abuse they've experienced or because of integrity or because that's what their soul tells them to do. And it's the believing parent that reprimands or instructs the child about showing more love and tolerance about non-belief. And imagine the flip side where a kid becomes secular and a kid starts mocking believers. And it's the non-believing partner that says, hey child, that's, that's your believing mom you're talking about. Don't make fun of belief. People who believe it's important to them, and those beliefs are sacred to them. And again, it's the non-believer who's making that argument. And so 
if you can keep in mind the goal of working towards the point where you shift from defending turf um, to defending the other person's position, you'll know that you've really not only understood where they are, but shown to them that you will fight for their uh, their position and the right for them and the validity of them to hold the place that they hold. And so we just offer that up as a goal so that any relationship you have that really achieves kind of a level five or a 10, depending on your scale of intimacy, this is a characteristic to kind of strive for. I just briefly, I'll just share a little bit of what you would probably talk in the communicating with believer people, but this is a very um, important principle when talking to your believing family and friends. So starting off again with the sandwich approach of, I don't want to do anything that would put your testimony or your beliefs or your ideas feeling threatened or feeling like that's not my intent, that's not my agenda. Sometimes we've got to watch that because it is our agenda. <laughs> so we have to be really mindful about our own agendas. And again, do we want the believer to send us the enzyme articles and to send over the missionaries and to send over, you know, we don't want that. We don't want to be convinced away from our positions that we feel like we've come to honestly. So can we offer the same in return, right? Like my only intent in sharing anything is only for understanding, communication, vulnerability. It is not because I'm trying to attack where you're coming from. So this is a really important aspect. It can also be a really important aspect in divorce. And this is really hard because there's nothing that brings up turf wars more than divorce or the idea of separation. So can I still be committed to your well-being outside of our marriage, especially if we have children? And can we really give that type of um, role modeling to kiddos? And there are a lot of separations and divorce around faith transitions just because it's one piece of oftentimes you're having to relook at your entire relationship at that point. So it's, it's really um, a very high level concept that I think really teaches us what maybe I would call true religion to really be able to do this. Yeah. Um, the, the, why don't you take this one? Yeah, so, um, I mean, we've been kind of talking about these things all the time, but the concept of differentiation is just something I want to really quickly explain. Uh, we, we hear a lot about individuation, and that's a value that, again, Americans have greatly, is how to become an individual, stand on your own two feet, <laughs> you know, strap your boots up <laughs> kind of ideas. And so differentiation is really a, a, a bit different than that in that it's actually not about the individual at all. It's about a relationship being able to tolerate its differences. Okay, so it's not well, I don't need to agree with you, so I'm gonna go be by myself and stand on my own. That's individuation. Uh, differentiation is I'm, I'm gonna stay connected. There's still gonna be a tension of commitment and love and loyalty between us in spite of the natural anxieties that come with difference. So this is um, a highly differentiated, you know, parent, for example, can tolerate the very anxious <laughs> feelings that come when our kids are quite different than how we'd want them to be or think differently than we want them to be or taking risks that we don't agree with, right? Things of that nature. I'm sure you can all at some level resonate with that. Um, and, I, and it's interesting, um, again, in a different presentation, I go into this uh, more in depth as far as how systems and individuals are different in their differentiation abilities, right? And so um, you have, like the church as an entity, as an organization, has a certain differentiation level of how much difference it will tolerate. Certain wards will have different to <laughs> abilities to tolerate different levels of, of difference. I know my Ann Arbor, Michigan ward, which was very much, you know, in a liberal city and liberal college was a very different feel than my Wichita, Kansas ward, right? And so the levels of differentiation were very different as a system. 
So that's something that, you know, I think we can think about how do we tolerate our own anxiety when our loved ones don't respond the way we want them to, when they believe differently than what we want, when we see them um, thinking differently. And then, of course, the boundaries are how do we create these spaces where we know what we can offer, what we're not willing to you know, put up with, per se, and how do we do that in a respectful way. So I think we've touched on a lot of these principles, but if anybody has any further questions, I'd be happy to. I'll just, I'll just say my little piece about these two things. In, in Mormonism and in many Orthodox religions, sameness equals good. If we're the same, if we dress white shirts and ties, skirts, shoulder, you know, all the different look, haircut, right, behavior, uh, that's good. Oh, somebody's got hair that's different or too many earrings or drinks the wrong beverage. They're bad, right? Um, that's fine. There, you know, military is an example of maybe, maybe an institution where there are reasons for sameness being good. And again, corporations or churches or whatever, I can understand from an institutional perspective why the need for identity or for conformity, for, you know, an obedience culture... I'm not really condemning that per se, but what, what is required in terms of a mentality shift for emotional intimacy is this idea of not just tolerating differences, but celebrating differences as actually really useful and valuable. And it's a total mind shift because as Mormons, I think our in, we're conditioned for our instinctive reaction to be concerned if there's difference, right? It, you know, I'm, I'm always like, I'm, it's, it's been really perplexing to me whenever I go to a party um, with post Mormons and there's alcohol, how really uncomfortable many post Mormons are that I don't drink. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's funny, but it's also, it's, and, and you know, I'm not talking about anything specifically that happened last night per se. Uh, but, um, <laughs> But I, I, there have been people that I've known in post-Mormonism that, like, every time we're together, it's like, well, do you drink yet? Why don't you drink yet? You know what I mean? And outside of Mormonism, you would never, you know, if I'm at Microsoft in Seattle, no one would ever ask once. But if they asked once, they would never ask again. It certainly wouldn't be something that someone would ask over and over and over and over again. And there's a sense that there's this, I think, as post-Mormons, we still carry with us a lot of our Mormonness. We take our Mormonism and I with think, us. Yeah. <laughs> and part of it's this binary worldview, and part of it is just this intolerance of difference. Why is my not drinking making you so uncomfortable? <laughs> I don't judge you. It's not a moral position. It shouldn't matter. It shouldn't even be something that's brought up necessarily. I mean, it's okay if there's curiosity. I realize I'm a public figure. But it, it, it is, it, you know, it's kind of... I'm just struck by how uncomfortable sometimes people are at that differentiation. And all I'm saying is, is uh, differences can not only be, um, you know, we, we not only need to tolerate differences, we need to celebrate differences. Think about the varieties of food that we have. Think about the way different cultures, different genders, not only just allow us to be more broad-minded, but inform and provide creativity or thought or expertise or insight that we would never get. Um, you know, a salad with lots of ingredients is better than a salad with just one or two. At least that's how I feel. Um, differences are great. So that is one important capstone principle for emotional intimacy, where you're not threatened by the differences. You embrace them and celebrate them. So if you're more analytical and your partner is more emotional, you celebrate that. If you're more introverted and they're more extroverted, you celebrate that and you value the differences that you bring and how each of those differences actually enriches the relationship and helps teach the other um, different ways of being. Margie tends to be more introverted sometimes. I tend to be more extroverted. She's helped ground me so that I'm not like all over the world and neglecting what's most important. And maybe I've helped her get out of her comfort zone sometimes and meet new people or have new experiences that she otherwise might not have had. And so it's just an important principle. The second is boundaries. And I'll just say that in Mormonism and in life, sometimes we equate a boundary as meaning I don't love you. In other words, 
if I say I don't want to talk about that right now or I need you to not do this that you've been doing, I think as, as Mormons we have this reaction of like, well, you must not care about me or you must not love me anymore. You must not trust me. Um, and, uh, you're not and being I, kind or you're not being Or you're forgiving. rude or you're mean or I feel a bad thing and that's the spirit of contention. So you're introducing contention <laughs> into our, you know, there's all different ways. And, and by the way, I, I think Mormons are famously awful at boundaries. And we get it from a very young age where a, a 45-year-old man can ask a 12-year-old girl alone in a room where she might touch herself or not. Like, and that's an extreme example, but there are all sorts of ways. You know, okay, it's not. It's not. Or like, how many of you women have like noticed when someone's trying to see if you're wearing what undergarments you're wearing or not, right? They, might, they touch you or how they touch your back or they're looking at your, you know... Like, we, we, we feel comfortable asking people what underwear they're wearing. We right? ask about family we, planning we feel comfortable, inappropriately. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Why, aren't you, why aren't you working? Why do you have so many, you know, why don't you have so many kids? Why, have you tried to have kids? Like, what's going on? Why do you work outside the home? You know, just all sorts of things that in polite, educated company would be completely outrageous. <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's like. Well, including, uh, like, father-in-laws asking new Suspe- or prospects, suspects, prospects about pornography use. I mean, adult men, right? Being asked by their adult father-in-laws. Um, all kinds of things. So, yeah, it's we stink at boundaries. Yeah, we're we really, really awful. Tithing settlement is, I mean, how much do you give? Let's, let's review how much you've given our nonprofit, voluntary, you know, contribution organization, charitable organization. Hmm, have you given enough this year? Have you have you met your quota? Like that's just all. Other churches don't do that, believe it or not, right? Um, so anyway, I made the point. But the point is, we have to have a shift for emotional intimacy. A boundary can mean, and I get this from Brene Brown, Margie through through Margie. You know, Brene Brown says a boundary can actually mean I love you. It means I care about our relationship so much, and you can say this to your mom or your dad or your in laws or whoever your spouse. He says to your spouse, I love you so much. I value our relationship so much. There's this thing you're doing that is causing me a lot of sadness and distress, and it's, and it's pulling me away from you. And I don't want to be distant from you. And so I am putting up a boundary, but it's not a boundary that says, get away from me, I don't love you, I don't like you. It's a boundary that says, I value our relationship so much, I'm going to put up this boundary so that we enjoy being around each other and we want to spend time together. And if you can respect this boundary, then we can go on having as good as or even a better relationship. If you can't respect this boundary, it might mean that I have to reduce the amount of time or the ways that we spend time together because otherwise it's hurting me and it's hurting our relationship. And I know you don't want me to be hurt, and I'm hoping that you value our relationship, and so I'm going to ask you to respect this boundary. And, you know, it goes back to that saying of good fences make good neighbors, right? That's, that's the new way to look at boundaries. They actually mean I love you. I want to keep you in my life, and, for us to ha- and, and, and I'll respect your boundaries, but I need you to respect mine. Does that make sense? And those are just some capstone components to uh, the, the, the structure of what emotional intimacy can look like. And Does going that make back sense? to vulnerability, the vulnerability discussion, some boundaries will look like white picket fences that are nice and polite, and have a lot of room to get over. And some boundaries will look like the, you know, the prison, you know, like barbed wire stuff up, you know, at the top because, again, you're dealing with you know, anytime you put forward a boundary, you're also really inviting another person to also put forward a boundary, right? Because in a sense, their yes or no to your boundary is a boundary of their own, right? And so if they're not going to respect your boundary, that's them basically saying, hey, I, that's not an okay negotiation between you and I. So just because you put forth a boundary doesn't mean you're going to get it. It's just the beginning negotiation piece. And so then you have to decide what the consequence is going to be in regards to a certain boundary being breached or not. So hopefully we can have a lot more white picket fences than barbed wire, but yeah. Or brick walls. (laughs) 
<laughs> Will you share that with Margie, please? And whoever else is raising their hand. Just a real quick thing with boundaries. I think we oftentimes think about them with regard to other people. We, we boundary, which it completely works. One thing um, that we've found to be really helpful is sometimes we're the ones that need to be boundaried. So there's this idea of boundarying ourselves for the sake of the relationship. And an example of that would be when you're in a heated argument with your spouse or someone you love, and you can recognize you're triggered. You, you have actually crossed over and you're going to hurt the person you love. And you can actually boundary yourself and do that in a way where you say, you know what, and you always speak your point of view for, about yourself so it's not like you're all, you know, hot over there and you need to calm down so we're going to have a boundary so you can chill. It's yourself. So it's like I'm noticing for me right now I'm feeling overwhelmed and um, I really love you and I care about this conversation too much to kind of go right now because I'm afraid you know, I'm going to say things that will hurt you. So what I'm going to ask is just let's take a break and I'll come back to you, let's say, by the end of day and we can talk about this in a way where I feel like I can, you know, speak from a place that will help our relationship. So boundarying ourselves, too. That's a great, yeah, that's... That's a great example Margie just gave of what's considered a time out. What you have to be very careful, which she role modeled, is the person who takes the time out is responsible for coming back to the table. Because typically, especially in a marriage, there's a classic pursuer and a classic withdrawer. So it's very easy for the withdrawer to say, time out. And for the pursuer to honor that is very difficult. And if the withdrawer doesn't build trust that they come back to the table, then the withdrawer, then the pursuer's like, well, why am I even going to honor that? You never come back to the table. So, you know, hell to the no. So, <laughs> so if you're the one that's calling the time out, make sure that you're the one that comes back to the drawing board. Um, I wanted to... Batteries are incredibly important, and I, and I love, thank you, uh, Margie, for what you said. I wanted to go back just real quick to differentiation as well, because that hit me when we were talking about it. I think um, one thing about my faith crisis and being able to kind of look outside and around is how much I appreciate diversity now. Um, I think as, as members of the church, we, we, I mean, the whole idea of missionary work is go out and find people that aren't enough like you and make them more like you, right? I mean, that's the whole idea is, and it's like, so we can have things in common. I get that. Oh, you believe in Joseph Smith? Me too. All right. You know, and, uh, but it's also subconsciously almost like we want them to suffer as much as we do, you know? Oh, you pay tithing too? Yeah, me too. Oh, good. Oh, you go to extra meetings? Oh yeah. You know, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and when you kind of take, you step outside of that and you look around and it's like, now people that are of different faiths, different cultures, races, you name it, it's beautiful. It used to be like, oh, that neighbor is gay, that neighbor smokes, that neighbor has tattoos, so don't try missionary work on them. But it's, it's beautiful. <laughs> people think this, and it, I've seen, heard people talk about it, but, but it really, it's, um, it's just beautiful to see differentiation different people and have friends that are different than you that can enrich your life and, and, and you know, uh, ex live by their experiences, learn and, and, and communicate. It's just a, a great thing that I think is very helpful for all of us. Okay. Um, I also want to talk about differentiation. <laughs> um, I can't say that word. Uh, thanks. <laughs> Um, uh, when it comes to faith transitions, um, my little sister, I really appreciated how she reacted to when I told her that I was leaving the church. She's very, very Mormon. And um, she responded, uh, or when I was talking to her last, and she wanted to know how my spirituality has changed. And she was open to that. Like she, she said, I really am interested in how... Um, how things have changed for you. And that really meant a lot to me that she wanted to hear and she was open to hearing a different point of view. And, um, and that I didn't put up any boundaries for her, but it was unspoken and she knew that, you know, not to proselytize me and I don't proselytize her. And so she was able to have that healthy boundary between us and also to appreciate that we have differences now and she wants to know about them. And that, that meant a lot to me. say curiosity is a huge ingredient to differentiation 
and that's that's a great example of that. Yeah. That would be awesome if I had someone ever ask me. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm serious. Do you have any insight to that? Because it's really wonderful that no one waves at me in my neighborhood anymore. They obviously see that I'm not wearing my garments, and I put in my second earring. And so they, they but no one asks. No one asks unless they want me to go to some sort of church thing and I've asked to please don't uh, um, come to me with church stuff but that doesn't mean that I don't want to get to know you but they don't want to obviously they don't want to know why they don't ask me they don't what what what, what? <laughs> yeah. does anybody have any answer I mean I just yeah. I feel so alone I mean searching it's like so excited I have a friend <laughs> you know it's just because I seriously have yeah. lost all of my friends yeah First of all, you need to you need to look into Waka. Have you heard of Waka? I have never. Okay. All right. It's not that easy. Yeah. I don't have anybody really close by. Okay. And that's and that is what Mormon Spectrum is about and that's what these uh, Thrive communities are trying to be about. We need more local communities, more face-to-face communities. What you just described is what I call the cricket effect. You know, we write as 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 transitioning or post-Mormons, we write these exit letters. Sometimes there's longer than the CES letter where we're going to, where we're basically, here's the 500 reasons I'm leaving Mormonism and why the church is a cult and Fanny Alger and peep stones and LGBT people and feminism and blah, 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 you know, uh, ad nauseum. And we put all this effort into it. We think they really care and they really love us and they really want to know, should I email my ward? Should I email my leadership should I email my siblings you know and for all the effort that goes into these huge exit letters overwhelmingly the most common response is no response and in my experience the overwhelming experience with these exit letters is that they're not read and the reason why they're not read there's a there's a simple reason and then a more complex reason the simple reason is well they get a bad feeling as soon as they start reading it And they're taught that, you know, if you get a bad feeling, well, that's the Holy Ghost telling you. It's not that that bad feeling is like, oh, my gosh, this is terrible and hard and uncomfortable and there are problems here. And so I feel unsettled. Instead, we're conditioned to say, oh, I feel uncomfortable. That's Satan. So I have to stop. And they stop. Right. Um, But there's a deeper reason. There's a reason I pulled up this slide. Um, It's as we know what religion emerges out of an attempt to answer these fundamental questions. And I, it wasn't an accident that I picked someone balled up in a fetal position in a corner representing what it feels like uh, to not have answers to all these questions. And, and the reason why the cricket effect is so strong, in my opinion, is because people understand somewhere subconsciously that they're relying on the church to fill all these holes. And it's, it's not simply just a matter of like, I really want to understand you better and I want to know you, right? It's if I talk to them, and this may be a subconscious process, but I think what's going on is they're basically saying, if I talk to them, the virus might spread to me and then I am going to end up with my entire worldview unraveling. It could threaten my marriage. It could cause me to get fired. It could make my kids not want to be around me anymore. It could, I could lose my community and I could lose my comfort in an afterlife and everything that my entire life is based upon. And guess what? They're right. They could lose all that as you all know. (laughs) And so it's not, it's kind of understandable why the, the walls go up really fast, right? F- plus the fact that we've all been conditioned to ignore information, to th- control our thoughts in only ways that are acceptable, to avoid any person that ever could be a threat to that, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, I, I, you probably knew all this already, but that's why we, the cricket's response is so pervasive within Mormonism. Wouldn't it be amazing if all of our friends and family responded like, whoa, really? 
you're so smart and wise that if you're having questions, I want to know all about it. Because at a minimum, I love you and you're important to me. And so I want to know everything about what you're experiencing because I care about you. But if you're smart enough and strong enough and honest enough in the rest of your life, and you're having questions here that I want to know what you've discovered because maybe I'll learn something too. You know what I mean? Isn't, wouldn't that be amazing? Yes. And, then ra- and then rainbows the would come down and butterfly <laughs> unicorns with jelly beans would fly from the sky. And, right? I mean, but that's just not the reality that we live in. Okay, a few comments. I just want to also say when... So my experience when my brother left the church he was the first one out of um my family and then my other brother a week later and it was during the um 2015 policy um he sent a detailed letter email to the family stating all the reasons why the church just what you said like huge letter to me and my several of my sisters we took that literally as a personal rejection of us of our identity, of who we were. Like, we are not good enough for you. Like, we're stupid for believing this. And the crazy thing is, is I was even a doubter at that time. I had a lot of doubts in my mind, and I there were a lot of things I didn't believe in. But for some reason, I still was enough in that I, to have him in my life was painful to me because... I felt like he was rejecting me as a human, as a person, as because it was so wrapped up in my identity. And so that's what I try to remember when people act like that. And I, I try, you know, to help them understand that that's not what I'm doing. And, you know, because if you can feel like what it would, what you feel like to feel rejected, I don't know, that's kind of what we feel felt <laughs> so and it wasn't him person now that I you know am where I am now I understand it wasn't a personal rejection and I feel sad for the way that I did I was crickets I was like I'm I just can't talk to him right now and I can't talk to my other brother right now and little did I know how much pain they were in and so that's sad to me but anyway I just want to suggest that also is yes. is a piece to it I love that. And think about anything that you feel really passionate about and think about a person that you really care about sending you a list of 50 things why you shouldn't be passionate about that thing that you really hold dear right now. Gun control, the environment, abortion, politics. How well that would go over for you. Right? I mean, it is. I mean, a lot of this is just human nature. It, It just really is. Yeah. So... Um, we are so we are so thrilled at at what we've been able to do together uh, for this session, and um, you know I'll just conclude by kind of summarizing these points. This is kind of it all on one slide. If you want to take a picture of this, or we'll send we'll share these slides afterwards. But just to summarize, if the, you know for us what we're offering to you is kind of a formula for emotional intimacy, is to get healthy yourself to to make sure you select uh, healthy people that you're going to try and engage with, to become clear on your values, to build on common values in these relationships, to offer and expect unconditional love, to be vulnerable and to nurture, to make it safe for the other person to want to be vulnerable with you, listen, understand and empathize, spend quality time together, Fight for the other perspective, not for your own. Differentiate and enforce lovingly healthy boundaries. And that is our presentation. Right. So thank you.